Namaste. In this video, we shall be looking at the second of the Mukhya Upanishads, which is Kena Upanishad. Now, an introduction to the Kena Upanishad. The Kena Upanishad is also known as the Talavakara Upanishad. It starts with the shloka Kene Shitam Patati. Similarly, just as we uh, saw in the case of the Isha Upanishad, it is called Isha Upanishad because it begins with the shloka Isha Vasya. Similarly, the Kena Upanishad gets its name because it starts with the shloka Kene Shitam Patati. It's a very popular shloka. And therefore, it's called the Kena Upanishad. Kena Upanishad. It is present in the form of a dialogue between a Shishya, a Shishya and a Guru who are both unnamed. It primarily deals with the nature of the self, the way to its realization and the result of Brahma Jnana, which is the knowledge of Brahman or reality. Now, there are three topics mentioned in the uh, UGC syllabus to be covered under Kena Upanishad. The first of that is the self and the mind. Now, as I had mentioned, the Kena Upanishad begins with the shloka, the popular shloka, Kene Shitam Padati Preshitam Manaha, which is, which is the uh, Shishya asking the Guru, impelled by whom do the mind, the prana, the speech, the eyes and the ears do their respective functions? It's a beautiful shloka. And the Guru answers by saying that it is the mind of the mind, the prana of the prana, the speech of the speech, eyes of the eye and the ears of the ear. That too, again, is a popular uh, shloka. And uh, the significance of that reply is to, is to bring out that the mind, the prana, the speech, eyes, ears, everything, they are known by something behind them. When he says it is the mind of the mind, he says that it is something which is not the mind, not the mind that we think. The functioning of the mind or prana or whatever it is, is not because of the mind or because of prana. It is something apart from all these, which is why he uses the terms mind of the mind, prana of prana. To say that that which makes all these function is something which is apart from all these. And it is, it is something which gives them their functional reality. Whatever function we think that the mind does, whatever function we think that the prana does because of its own nature, it is actually uh, given to it because of this thing which activates them. So that is the significance of the Guru's reply. It is to bring out that the mind, etc. are all known by Brahman, which is the self for the consciousness. And it is because of Brahman that the mind, etc. perform their functions. Now in, in all my videos which cover the Upanishads, uh, the terms Brahman, Self, Atman, Consciousness, uh, Sakshi Chaitanyam, all these refer to the same, God, whatever it is, refer to the same thing. I think when uh, it is my belief that in Advaita Vedanta, these terms are uh, interchangeably usable. They all refer to the same one reality. When we come to other philosophies like Vishishta, Dvaita or Dvaita, they have separate meanings. Uh, they have separate, Atman means a separate thing, Brahman means a separate thing for them. But in whatever video I am going to be presenting, these all mean the same thing. If I have used the term self or Brahman or consciousness, they all refer to the same thing. It is that supreme reality because of which all this exists. So, so th th those terms are interchangeably, can be interchangeably used. Now, under the topic self and the mind, the first thing we've seen is that it is the uh, self or Brahman which gives the mind its functioning. It is that which impels the mind to work. The second thing we see is that we find it repeated in the Upanishad in many places that the Guru very clearly says, that the self cannot be known by the mind or any other sense organs. Na tatra chakshur gachati, na vag gachati, no manaha, which means there the eyes cannot go, there speech cannot go, nor can the mind go. It means that it cannot be known by the mind or by any other sense organ. The self or Brahman cannot be known by the sense organs or the mind. He also declares that it is because of the self and the mind that the other sense organs are known. Sorry, self that the mind and the other sense organs are known. So he says that it is the self which knows the mind, it is the self which knows the sense organs and it is not the other way around. The sense organs or the mind cannot know the self. The self is declared as different from the known and beyond the unknown. Now this is a very uh, important point in the Kena Upanishad. They, they, they describe the self to be something which is different from that which can be known. But it is also beyond the unknown. Now what does it mean? Now all our experiences or everything uh, Whatever we, uh, you know, whatever can be known, can be classified into two things. There are things that we know. There are things that we don't know. Right. So he says that the self is, is different from the known, but it's also beyond the unknown. Now what it means is, uh, take the example of 
uh, seeing something. Suppose, uh, let's say I see a dog. Now, because I see the dog, I know that the dog exists. The proof of the existence of the dog is that I can objectively see it, right? But the act of seeing the dog also proves the existence of another thing. It also proves that I have my eyes, that my eyes are functioning well. Now, how do I know that my eyes exist? It is not that I've seen them. The proof of the dog is that I've seen the dog, but the proof of my eyes is not that I've seen the eyes. The proof is different here. The proof is that the very act of seeing anything proves that, proves that my eyes exist. So that is an intuitive knowledge of knowing that the subject exists. So similarly, now the eyes cannot technically be called something which is known by them. But they are also not unknown. We know that they exist. But it is well, when they say that the self is beyond the known and uh, different from the known and beyond the unknown, it has to be understood in the sense that it is different from the known because it is not an object like, you know, just like the eyes themselves are not an object of vision. We can see them as a reflection in the mirror, but we can't directly see them, right? So similarly, the self cannot be uh, objectively known because it is not an object, but it is also beyond the unknown because just like every act of seeing things prove that our eyes exist, every act of experience proves that the self exists. So they are also beyond the unknown. One cannot say that he knows the self, nor can he say that he does not know the self. So that is the idea that the Keno Prishad tries to convey. So this is about the self and the mind. The second topic is intuitive realization of the truth. Uh, so as I had mentioned, so what happens is the Guru first explains to the Shishya that these are the characteristics of Brahman. This is what Brahman is. But then he also warns the Shishya against thinking that he knows Brahman sufficiently well. He says, just because you've heard me explaining about it, do not think that you know it well enough. Do not think that you know it sufficiently well enough. You know, The Guru says that one who thinks he knows Brahman well doesn't know it in reality. This Upanishad also contains the uh, uh, popularly confusing verse which says, it is known to him who does not know it and it is unknown to him who knows it. Avignatam vijanatam vignatam avijanatam. Now this again, it can be interpreted in the light of what I explained earlier that one who thinks that the self or the consciousness or Brahman is something uh, which can be known objectively and thinks that some part of his mind is the self, you know, wrongly identifies perhaps the intellect with his self. He does not know it because he, he, he has mistakenly objectified the self. So he does not know it. He who thinks who knows it does not know it. It is unknown to him who knows it. it sorry, it is known to him who does not know it. Meaning he who realizes that the Brahman or the self cannot be known objectively and only intuitively realizes it, he, he knows it because he knows that he cannot know it. That, that's a very uh, convoluted way of using language, but that is, that is what the Upanishad tries to convey. The idea that the Guru tries to convey is that Brahman is not something to be known in the sense of knowing something objectively using the sense organs or the mind. Now, I mean, in order to fully understand the Keno Upanishad, one has to study it in detail. For, 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 from the point of view of the net exam, that won't be required. I'm just giving the main points that are uh, covered in the Keno Upanishad. Now, again, one more important thing is that in each Upanishad, I'm only going to be covering whatever topic has been mentioned in the syllabus. There are other things in the Keno Upanishad outside of these topics. So those of you who are interested in knowing it in detail, please do study the book. It's a tiny book. It has only four chapters and uh, around maybe 40 shlokas perhaps. It's a tiny book. I think this should be sufficient from the exam point of view though. I've, I've, I've been covering all the topics that are mentioned in the syllabus. So that is about the intuitive realization of the truth. Upanishad also mentions how Brahman is to be realized intuitively. So next the question comes, if, if it cannot be uh, if it cannot be known and it is beyond the unknown, then how does one experience it? How does one realize that truth? Right. So the Upanishad says that the knowers of Brahman, those who really know it, those who have realized it, know it to be present in all experiences as the self or the Sakshi Chaitan. What it means is, just like, going back to the same example, just like by seeing anything, anything at all, we know that it is because of the eyes that we see it. It is the eyes which are the substratum of all our uh, all experiences that are seen, all that we can see is because of the eyes. Similarly, the knowers of Brahman realize that it is because of the self, the pure consciousness, that all experiences are possible. 
so in that way they realize the self in all experiences pratibodha vid pratibodha viditam that is the term used in the upanishad that they realize the self or pure consciousness in all experiences it is not that they uh, to realize the self they meditate and you know go into samadhi and only in that in that state they realize the truth the real knowers of brahman according to this upanishad realize that in all experiences whatever they are doing they see the re- they see reality in all experiences that is the that is how uh, brahman is to be realized the wise man knows brahman to be present in all things and beings and this realization makes him immortal this is again a very common theme which will be finding in all the upanishads that knowing brahman one becomes immortal so that is about the intuitive realization of the truth the final topic which is to be covered in the kena upanishad this is a is a relatively fun topic compared to the other two topics we've covered this is uh, less of philosophy and more of mythology it is the moral of the yaksha upa, yaksha upakhyana uh, upakhyana means a story or an, uh, or an anecdote so the third part of the kena upanishad begins with a story i told you there are four parts to this upanishad the third part begins with a story about a war between the devas and the asuras the devas are the gods and the asuras are the demons uh, good and bad uh, to easily understand the devas emerge victorious in the battle and become elated thinking that the victory and the glory was there so they get the feeling that you know it is because of them it is because of their effort that the war has been won so their pride enters into them brahman knowing this appeared before them as a yaksha yaksha uh, yaksha also refers to a species of beings but here it refers to somebody who is respectable as a respectable person he appears in front of them as a respectable venerable being uh, the devas could not make out who the yaksha was the devas the devas looked at him but nobody knew who it was so they so all the devas uh, the main devas mentioned in the upanishad are indra uh, agni and uh, vayu so both of them ask agni to go and find out he says you go find out who this yaksha is so agni goes to the yaksha to find out who he is seeing agni yaksha asks the yaksha asks him who are you and what do you do to which agni replies i am fire and i have the power to burn everything i have the potential to burn anything i want now the yaksha on listening to this raises a straw uh, you know a strand of grass perhaps before agni and says you burn this i have kept i have just kept a strand of grass you, you burn it if you can agni tries to burn it but uh, surprisingly finds out that he can't burn it and so he returns you know to other other devas and tells them i could not find out who that fellow was and uh, i also was very surprised to find that i could not burn a spear, you know a straw of grass so next what the devas do they send vayu to find out who it is so then vayu goes the yaksha repeats the same question who are you and what can you do vayu replies i am air and i can blow everything away so again the yaksha places a straw before vayu and asks him to blow it away yeah the vayu too similar to what happened to agni finds that he is utterly powerless to blow away that straw now he too returns and uh, now both agni and uh, vayu turn to indra who is the king of the gods and tell him see we've tried and we've failed now you go you try to find out who he is so indra goes and uh, seeks to find out who the yaksha is but as he nears the yaksha the yaksha disappears and in his place uh, goddess uma appears uma the wife of shiva haimavati uma appears and she explains that the yaksha was in fact brahman because of whom the war was won by the devas so she explains to the devas that you know this was just a uh this was the yaksha was brahman all along and he just came in the form of a yaksha in order to uh let you know that uh thinking that it was because of you that the battle was won was a mistake it was it, the you yourself have no potential and that the moral is that the it was brahman it was because of the brahman that the battle was won it the moral is again what we found in the beginning of the kena upanishad that everything derives its functionality from brahman there is a popular uh, saying in indian philosophy tena vina trinam api na chalati without him without him not even a blade of grass can move so that that's a popular thing that is said that it means that without brahman one cannot do anything uh, the mind cannot function the prana cannot function the sense organs cannot function it is because of brahman that all these things get their reality and their functionality so so uma explains to indra that you know brahman just uh, uh, you know came in the form of a yaksha and tested you all in order to enlighten you about this in order to let you know that you know 
you shouldn't there is no point in feeling proud of what you've done what has happened it is not you who have won the battle but brahman himself who has done it it is because of brahman that all this happened so the moral of the story about the aksha is that it is because of brahman's presence that the whole universe functions now again uh, one can look at agni vayu and indra are man, as manifestations of the universe certain forces of the universe certain elementary forces of the universe instead of people in which case you know this, this this is what it could mean that it is because of brahman's presence that the whole universe functions that that uh, you know wind blows that fire burns and all that in other words brahman is the substratum and reality of everything so this is the moral of the yaksha upakhyana upakhyana so with this we finish the topics mentioned under kenopanishad thank you